Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you on this beautiful Lord's Day. Please have your Bibles open to Romans chapter 1. We're going to begin there in just a moment. Romans chapter 1. If you're visiting with us, thank you so much for being here. You are our honored guests, and we want to, to make you feel welcome, and we want you to, uh, to stick around after services so that we can get to know you better and that you can get to know us better as well. Romans chapter 1. We'll read that in just a little bit. But before we do, I want to talk a little bit about the, the beauty of the United States government and how it is set up. It is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Inherent in our, the way our government is set up, that there is nobody who has the right to rule over us unless the people put them there. We vote our leaders in, our governors, our representatives, our senators, our president. We get to vote them in. And not only do we get that amazing right, but we get to take them out if we wanted to. If they don't live up to their campaign trail promises or whatever, we kind of take pride in the fact that, that we can go to the voting booth and vote them out of office. So we have the right to put them there. We have the right to take them out. And if that wasn't beautiful enough, we limit their power when they get there with checks and balances and three branches of government. So if you add it all up, it's just amazing how the lengths that our founding fathers went to to avoid a monarchy. We vote them in, we take them out, we put term lengths on them, and then even while they're there, we limit their power with checks and balances. Here's why I bring this up. That could not be more opposite than the government of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of Jesus Christ could not be more opposite than what I just described. Jesus Christ is king. He is the king of kings. And he was not voted there by people. He will not be voted out by people. There are no checks and balances when it comes to Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Christ, and there is no term length, unless you want to say that the term is forever. And that is good news. It's gospel. Now, that may seem a little odd, the way I just said that, that, that his power, the overarching power of Jesus Christ, is gospel. But you'll understand why I'm saying it that, that way in just a moment. For the longest time, the way that I understood the term gospel, whenever it was mentioned, I understood it this way. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. That's immediately what came to my mind when I heard the term gospel. And as I've tried to retrain my brain, I've realized that it's more broad than that. That the good news isn't necessarily all about the human requirements of obeying the gospel. It's broader than that to include the good news that we can be saved at all, forgiven at all, that there's a heaven that God has prepared for us. But it's even broader than that. If you look up all the instances, which is hundreds, all the instances where the term gospel is mentioned, you will find that not, not only does it require human requirements, obedience, commandments, not only is it broader to include the idea that people can be forgiven at all, but sometimes the word gospel is used without reference to human beings. It's about the authority of Jesus Christ at times. And I think you see this in Romans chapter 1. And I'm not talking about verse 16, which we probably all have memorized. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That's not actually the first time that Paul uses the term gospel in Romans. Back up to verse 1 of chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his, through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son. Verse 1, I'm set apart for the gospel. Verse 2, God promised the gospel through the prophets. How did God promise the gospel? Concerning his Son, who was descended from David according to the flesh. Don't rush over that last statement in verse 3. That Jesus descended from David according to the flesh. 
That has reference to the promise, and that's what Paul is talking about, right? That he promised the gospel, the promise to David that he would establish one of his heirs and set up the throne of his kingdom forever, which we will read in just a moment. And then in verse 4, who was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. He says in one breath, Jesus Christ descended from David. He is a son of David. Then in the next breath, he says he's the son of God, according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection. Well, which is he? He's both. And that is the promised gospel of the Old Testament. But none of that has to do with how you obey. It has to do with the overarching authority that is Jesus Christ. Do you know why the human requirements are important to us? To begin with. It's because who Christ is. And if we ever get the cart before the horse where we aren't preaching Christ as King, first and foremost, that's not gospel preaching, like I see it in the New Testament. What I'm going to do this morning is very simple. I've entitled the lesson, Preaching the Promised Gospel. We're just going to go back to the Old Testament, and we're going to look at the gospel that was promised in the Old Testament, but we're going to limit ourselves to that statement in verse 3, that Jesus descended from David according to the flesh and the power that that statement contains. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is the time where God promises that one of David's heirs would have his, the throne of his kingdom established forever. David, in this context, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, he decides that he's going to build a house for God. He's living in a palace. He's dwelling in peace and incredible prosperity at this particular time. And David is thinking, I'm living in a palace. The worship of God is in a tent, that being the tabernacle. That's what the term tabernacle means. So I'm living in this luxury in a palace. God's worship is in a tent. We need to build God a, a more permanent structure here. And Nathan says, the prophet, he says, well, go ahead. Do whatever your heart desires. But then God comes to Nathan that night and says, No, no, you need to tell David, he's not going to build me a house. I'm going to build a house for him. One of the heirs, though, from his body will build me a house and I will establish his throne forever. And it has a dual fulfillment. Solomon would come from David and build a physical house, the physical temple. Jesus Christ would come from David and build a spiritual house. What is the church called in 1 Timothy chapter 3? The household of God. Read this passage with me. Verse 12 of 2 Samuel chapter 7. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up for you an offspring after you who shall come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. Verse 13. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of this kingdom forever. Again, a dual fulfillment, and there's other passages that indicate that there's a dual fulfillment here. Solomon would build the physical house. Jesus Christ would build the spiritual house, and they are both going to descend from David's own body. Well, this is great. Now, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of a Jew for a moment. You're a Jew in the Old Testament time period, and you realize what God is promising to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. But you know what happens to the history of Israel. Jeroboam, Rehoboam, the kingdom divides, the ten tribes, the two tribes, the northern tribes of Israel, the southern tribes of Judah. And, and, and what happens to them spiritually is that they degrade over time with very, very few exceptions. But they get worse and worse and worse to the point where God sends them all into captivity. And there is no king in Jerusalem at all, much less somebody from David. So if you're a Jew and there's no king in Jerusalem, but you're looking at this prophecy that somebody would come from the body of David 
and that the throne of his kingdom would be established forever, you've got to be scratching your head a little bit and wondering, how is God going to come true on this promise? And we don't necessarily even have to wonder about the Jews thinking that way. We have Psalm 89. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Psalm 89, and you're going to see that this was going to be a thought that the Jews were going to have. How is God going to come true on the promise that he made in 2 Samuel chapter 7 if the throne has been cast down, if Jerusalem has been trampled underfoot? Look at verse 4 of Psalm 89, or verse 2 rather. Verse 2 of Psalm 89, For I said, Steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. And now the writer of Psalm 89, who is Ethan the Ezraite, he is going to quote exactly what God said in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 3. You have said, this is Ethan saying to God, you've said this, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Ethan is calling God's memory to what he said to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And then God responds. Look at verse 32 or 34. This is God speaking back to Ethan. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. I'm going to come true on this. What I said to David, I'm, I will not lie, verse 35 or verse 36, his offspring shall endure forever, his throne as long as the sun before me. Okay. This is exactly what we've read in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Ethan says, this is what you said. God says, that's exactly what I said. And you can bank on it. And now here's what's interesting. Ethan the Ezraite is going to speak by prophecy about a time where the throne of Jerusalem will be cast down. The kingdom will look like it's completely destroyed. And Ethan is going to ask, when are you going to come true on this? Look at verse 38. But you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath against your anointed. You have renounced the covenant. Wait, wait, wait a minute. God just said, I'm going to come true in the covenant. And Ethan says, no, you've renounced it. What is going on here? He is prophesying. By the way, Ethan lived in the time of Solomon. That's how we know that this is prophecy. He's speaking about a time where it looks like God is renouncing the covenant. You have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown in the dust, verse 40. You have breached all his walls, laid his strongholds in ruins. All who pass by him plunder him. He has become the scorn of his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his foes. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword. You have not made him to stand in battle, verse 44. You have made his splendor to cease and cast his throne to the ground. Ethan says, this is what you said. God says, that's exactly what I said. And Ethan speaks by prophecy and says, well, wait a minute. The throne's been cast down. And then Ethan starts asking, how long will it take for you to renew this? Look at verse 46. How long, O oh Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your, will your wrath burn like fire? Drop down to verse 49. Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? Can I just make a side point real quick? What an amazing blessing it is to have the Old and the New Testament. We've got the end of the story. We don't have to ask in confusion or despair. How long will it take for you to come true on this? Because we know God comes true in it in Jesus Christ. And that is gospel. In fact, you know what we call the first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2? I'm not super fond of calling it the first gospel sermon. But that's the day the kingdom is set up. 
That's the day where people were added to the church. And that day where, the, where Peter and the apostles are preaching in Acts chapter 2, do you remember what Peter preached? No, not verse 38. Before the human requirements. Go to Acts chapter 2 really quickly. Acts chapter 2, verse 30. Th verse 30. And it's almost like a, a parenthetical thought that Peter throws in here. Verse 30 of Acts chapter 2. Being therefore a prophet. Remember Romans chapter 1 now. Romans chapter 1 is where we started the lesson. The, the title of the lesson is the gospel that was promised. The pr preaching the promised gospel, right? By who? By the prophets. Being therefore a prophet, verse 30 says, and knowing that God had sworn to him with an oath that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. And this is why I say, before we preach any human requirements in the gospel, you know where we need to begin? Where Peter and the apostles began. That Christ is king. In fact, I'm getting to the point, and maybe this isn't wise. I'm getting to the point where I'm not sure it's wise to even tell people about repentance and baptism until they're convinced that their allegiance belongs to Jesus Christ. That's where the commandments of the gospel take their power. And until you're convinced that your allegiance belongs to the King of Kings, if you're not convinced of that, what does it matter that the King said? But let's go back to the timeline for a moment. I said just a moment ago, what, what a blessing it is that we have the, the New Testament and the Old Testament. We have the end of the story. But in reality, the Jews didn't actually need the, the New Testament to know what the timeline was. God gave them the timeline in the book of Daniel. Turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2, if you will. Daniel chapter 2. And let's just speak for the rest of the sermon about this timeline of when God would set up the eternal kingdom. When would God come true, spiritually speaking, on the, on the promise of 2 Samuel chapter 7? Daniel chapter 2, you know the context. Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream. That big statue with four different metals, gold, silver, bronze, iron, and then at the, the very bottom, the iron mixed with clay. And God, the revealer of mysteries, tells Daniel the interpretation of this dream, that the four metals are talking about four different kingdoms. Well, in that dream where he sees that statue, there is a stone that is cut out with no human hand. And then the stone becomes this great eternal kingdom that encompasses the whole earth, right? Listen to the timeline. The four statue or the four metals are four kingdoms. And during the fourth kingdom, verse 44, listen to what will happen. Chapter 2, verse 44. In the days of those kings, that is the fourth kingdom. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall it be left to another people. Does it sound like 2 Samuel chapter 7? I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The head of gold was Nebuchadnezzar. The silver, the Persian empire. The, the bronze, the Greeks. Greece. The iron, the Romans, and in about 27 B.C., the Romans set up Caesar Augustus. They get rid of their republic. The empire of Rome is established. And guess who comes on the scene about 30 years later? Jesus Christ. God's given the timeline right here. And yes, according to Psalm 89, there's going to be some Jews that scratch their head and say, well, well when is God going to come true on this? And God is, God is telling them, during the fourth world empire, that's exactly when I'm going to come true on it. Daniel chapter 2 is not the only prophecy that gives us the timeline in Daniel. Look at Daniel chapter 7 really quickly. I just want to make two points about Daniel chapter 7, and we'll wrap up the lesson, and it'll be yours. But in Daniel chapter 7, the four world empires are not represented by different metals. They are represented by different beasts, different animals. 
Well, after the fourth animal is established, that is the fourth world empire, look at what verse 17 and 18 say, Daniel chapter 7. These four great beasts are four kings. Read that, four kingdoms. Four kingdoms who shall arise out of the earth, but after the four have arisen, but, verse 18, the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. I love both of these passages. But I love Daniel chapter 7, verse, uh, Daniel 7 more. And I'll tell you why. There is not just a prophecy about the kingdom and the timeline. There is a prophecy about the king. Back up to verse 13. Daniel 7, verse 13. Underline these verses in your Bible, please. Or make a note, make a highlighter mark, do whatever. But remember them, please. Verse 13. I saw in the night visions. Behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And make a special note about the clouds. He's coming in the clouds, one like the son of man. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before Him. Stop right there. I don't have to remind you, but I will anyway. Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascends into heaven, what's His vehicle of motion? The clouds, right? We're not talking about Jesus coming down to the earth in clouds. Where is He going to? He's going up. He's going to where the Ancient of Days is, to the throne of God, right? This is the ascension of Jesus Christ. One came like the son of man, looking like a son of man on the clouds to the ancient of days. Now before we read verse 14, don't cheat on me. I want to ask you a question. Do you have you ever wondered what happened after the ascension of Jesus Christ? In Acts chapter 1, we're just told that he he left. But what happened in heaven when he got there? Here's the sequel. A king was coronated. Verse 14. And to him was given dominion and a glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Sound like 2 Samuel chapter 7? His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. A king was coronated after he was ascended. He was given glory and dominion and a kingdom. There is no boundaries to his rule. All nations, all languages, all peoples. There's no term length. He has all authority. And that's gospel. That's the promised gospel. And before people get the human requirements of the gospel, they need to get this. This is where we need to start. I'm not saying Daniel 7. That would be a difficult place to start. I'm talking about the message that Christ is king. And for people who live in the government that we live in in the United States, we kind of puff out our chest. You know, we're, we're the people. You know, we've got the right to put them in and take them out. We limit their power. It's good and it's healthy for us to remind ourselves that that's complete opposite of what we see in Jesus Christ. One last point. We're also given another sequel in the prophets to what happened after the ascension of Jesus Christ. This time it's the prophet in Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, that is the Ancient of Days, said to Jesus Christ, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's where Jesus Christ is right now. He has all glory, all dominion. He has the kingdom. He's at the right hand of God. And God is going to defeat all enemies and make them a footstool for Jesus' feet until God is ready to send Jesus and take out the last enemy on the last day. 
death. Please get out your songbooks and turn to the song of invitation. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is king? Do you believe that you owe him your allegiance? <clears throat> then when the king says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, that needs to hold some water to you. And if it does, and if you haven't responded in the obedience of faith, we bid you to come as together we stand and sing.